In this episode, we'll take a look at the Epifan Video Pearl 2, which I would call a live stream kind of all-in-one appliance. And this is gonna be for the higher end of the market. Now, I want to set the stage for this. This is not a review. This is more of an educational piece to, depending on where you're coming from, to either give you some context for why anyone in the world would ever want to pay $7,500 for a live streaming appliance. So if you're a hobbyist and you, you know, for you, it's like, that doesn't make any sense for me to spend that kind of money for something like this. Totally understand. I'm not trying to sell this to anybody. <laughs> What I am trying to do is give you some context for where it is an appropriate tool, where it would make sense. Someday, who knows, maybe you'll be in a situation where you will be hired to produce a live stream with a substantial budget, and something like this might make sense. Now, of course, for those of you that work in uh, corporate live streaming, uh, production companies, maybe in education, or perhaps in house of worship, something like this might make sense as well. For those of you that have no interest in this, you are dismissed. There is no reason to stick around. Just want to provide a little bit of background on when this makes sense. Now, most of you have probably heard, certainly those of you in my audience that come from a more hobby or kind of side hustle based live streaming world, this is a very different type of device from something like a Blackmagic ATEM Mini Live Switcher. So the question is, how is it different? Well, one of the things that I end up doing a lot in the corporate live streams that I work on is we often have remote guests. And in fact, our host is remote <laughs> from the, the main location where we do the actual live stream production. And so for us, what's really important is having an ability to bring in remote guests and our remote host and combine them all into one live stream and then stream out from there, in our case to YouTube, but you know whatever platform you're streaming to. And there are a variety of ways you can do that. There are some cloud services, and you might ask, well, why don't you just use something like uh, StreamYard or Restream.io or something like that? And certainly that is one option. There are some things that those don't really allow us to do very effectively where we prefer to have a little bit more control. And some people say, well, why don't you just use something like Zoom? It has an NDI interface. Why can't you just use Zoom to bring in remote guests? And indeed, you can do that as well. Zoom generally at least at the consumer level, doesn't provide the greatest of quality. I think there are some enterprise subscriptions you can do with Zoom, but we really wanted our own solution. And so what the Pearl 2 allows you to do is it uses a protocol called Secure Reliable Transport, SRT. And what SRT allows you to do is a very low latency protocol that allows you to bring a remote guest in to your Pearl 2, and then you can actually bring in multiple SRT streams from various locations throughout the world, bring them together and produce a show and then stream that out from there. So it is, again, really, really high quality and very low latency. So that's really nice. Now, you might ask, well, why don't you just use the ATEM hardware bridge, the little device they give you that allows you to bring in remote guests. And that's an, actually a really interesting device. But in the experience that I have so far, Secure Reliable Transport actually can can operate with much lower latency. And latency is important when you're doing live streams, especially with multiple guests, because if there's a lot of latency, it's really awkward when people are having conversations because they start to talk over each other because they don't receive the other feed for some, you know, say maybe at least half a second or longer, especially if it gets longer than that. It gets really awkward and people start talking over each other and things like that. SRT is actually quite good. And we actually did a live stream last year in 2021. And I'll put the link for that over here so you can see that. But myself and three of my friends, Photo Joseph, Aaron Parecki, and John Barker of Here to Record did a live stream. And the way it worked was each of the three of us sent our streams via SRT to Photo Joseph. And then he combined it on his Pearl 2 and then streamed not just to his own YouTube channel, but to my channel, Aaron Parecki's channel, and I believe John's channel as well. So we had 
four outgoing streams to different channels and four SRT remote or three SRT remote streams coming in to the Pearl 2. And being able to put all that together and make beautiful layouts was a super easy, <laughs> but also produced what I think is a really, really high quality show. Now there is one, I don't know if you want to look at it as a downside. There is one thing you do have to take into consideration is that is wherever the Pearl 2 is located, whatever firewall you have between that and the internet, there is some configuration you'll need to make to allow those SRT streams to come into the Pearl 2. So just something to keep in mind and that you're going to need to have an IT person or a network engineer or whatever it is in your particular case, or maybe it's just you streaming from home. I don't know. Whatever the case may be, is there is a little bit of configuration you'll need to do with your firewall to allow those streams in. The Pearl 2 has six inputs, two 12G SDI put inputs. If you don't know what that means, SDI is really nice because SDI, you can run cables much longer than you can HDMI. Um, it's a little different than HDMI from the standpoint that you don't get the communication. It doesn't do all the handshaking stuff. So you have to send the right signal from the source to the input on the Pearl or whatever other device has SDI inputs. But 12G allows you to bring in 4K sources. So it's a very high quality connection. It locks. Um, I love SDI. Actually, I'd prefer SDI over HDMI any day if I could. Um, so it does have two of those. And plus it does have four HDMI inputs for HD sources. So um, that's that's what you get on the Pearl 2, which gives you a total of six inputs. Now, what if that's not enough inputs? What if you need more? Well, you can always put a switcher in front of the Pearl 2 if you needed to do that as well. Now you might be scratching your head like, mm, I'm not getting it, Curtis. There's still got to be more to it. Well, there are definitely some more things to it. And let me run through some of those things. I think one thing that really sets it apart is the ability for I think you're going to see this, especially in corporate and in education, the ability to control the Pearl to configure it remotely using Epifan Cloud. And that's especially true in cases, for example, in corporations or in education where you have multiple Pearl devices spread out across various maybe different cities around the world. The ability to control those remotely becomes super important. Let me give you a use case. If I've got an executive who works at a remote office or works from home and needs to be able to be a contributor to a live stream on a regular basis, I can send out to that executive a camera, a microphone, some lighting, and a Pearl Nano. Pearl Nano is kind of the the, the younger sibling of the Pearl 2. It's smaller, it doesn't have as many inputs, um, but you, it has all these features as well. It can send an SRT stream remotely to the Pearl 2 that I'm using at the headquarters location and the nice thing is that I can control that Pearl Nano remotely from anywhere in the world. In addition to that, I can actually also live switch it as well. So if I'm controlling my Pearl 2 and I'm getting the SRT stream from that executive um, and maybe from another executive somewhere else, I can bring those into the Pearl 2, create my own beautiful layouts and be able to switch that with the Pearl 2. So that's something that's pretty unique. Now you might say, well, but Curtis, an A10 Mini is so much cheaper. Why don't I just use that? Well, the reality is, is that ex executives don't always have time or lecturers at a university don't always have time to learn all this technology. And so being able to administer that remotely makes a huge, huge difference and actually opens up opportunities that may not re be realistic otherwise. Another thing that's really cool about Pearl 2 is that you can stream to multiple destinations at the same time. So in this example that we showed earlier with the link, we had a setup where there were four of us on the live stream and we were streaming to all four of our YouTube channels at the same time. So we didn't need to use any other services to make that happen, no Restream IO or anything else. We just were able to stream directly from the Pearl 2. As far as I'm aware, none of the A10 minis are capable of doing that. Another great feature for those bigger productions, if you think, for example, of maybe a conference at a big hotel in the big conference room, is the ability to have balanced line inputs. So you can have a mixer set up there if you have multiple microphones and actually feed that audio directly into the Pearl 2. Uh, great, great feature. Having a physical mixer makes a huge, huge difference when you're trying to produce a really high quality production. And in those kind of circumstances for a conference, nobody has patience for crappy audio <laughs> sorry <laughs> but um i'm sorry i care about sound and having a 
very bad experience for your audience just isn't an option in those situations. If you're a working professional, if you're a production company, you have to produce something that is worth the money. And that's part of it. That's a baseline thing. You have to get the audio right. So having that ability to bring in balanced line inputs from a mixer, super, super great. Now, on the A10 minis, they have those inputs. They're unbalanced inputs, so that means you can't run really long cables or else you're much more likely to pick up interference. But um, that is an option if you need to do something like that in a pinch. Nice to have balanced inputs because then I can run much longer cables if the mixer can't sit right next to the Pearl 2, for example. Pearl 2 has a touch screen to be able to control and do some of the configuration, but really most of the work happens in a browser app that you connect to the Pearl 2 via the network that you're connected to. And this gives you the ability to do everything. I mean, all the detailed configuration, including setting up your layouts. And the layouts on the Pearl 2 are very, very different than how you approach things with an A10 Mini. A10 Mini is basically a production, kind of a traditional production mixer put into a really small form factor. So what that means is it approaches layout in the same way that it's always been done in production for a lot of, lot of years, decades. And it's, for example, if you want to set up more sophisticated layouts, you have to use things like upstream keys and downstream keys, and you have to get your mind up around how all of that works, which is a lot of fun to do. And, and of course, if you're a professional, of course you can do that. What's neat about the Pearl 2 though, from my perspective, is that it uses a basically a drag and drop interface to set up your layouts. And you can do some really cool things. Whereas you have to have an A10 mini that has a super source capability to um, create these more complex layouts. So for example, with this previous link that I showed you, the show that I did with my other friends, getting that layout set up on a Pearl 2 is super straightforward and really easy and intuitive. It's literally bringing in the different sources, dropping them on the canvas, cropping them, resizing them, placing them where you want them with your mouse. It's really, really straightforward on how to do things like that to make, to create these really beautiful and cool layouts. So that's the thing I really like about the Pearl 2 that makes it a little easier to use than a traditional broadcast switcher. Just like the A10 Mini ISO models, the Pearl 2 can record not only your program, but also your individual inputs. So that can be recorded to internal storage on the Pearl 2, or to external devices via USB. So you've got options there. If you just have a thumb drive, for example, a fast thumb drive, you can plug that right in and be able to record that. If you've got an external drive, you can do that. And of course, there is the internal storage. Now, when it comes to live switching, there is an app called Epifan Live, which allows you to do the live show to actually switch that. So that makes it easy. And you can put that on a tablet if you needed to so that you're not necessarily tied to a desk. Uh, so that makes things a little easier as well. Now, a feature that was put into the Pearl 2's really kind of catering to the education world or perhaps to the corporate world is that when you're done with a program, it can actually automatically upload the recordings to a content management system or to an FTP file server, whatever it is you need it to do. So that comes in real handy again in the corporate world and in education. I think a great use case for that in the education world is if you're recording a lecture as soon as that's done, there are a variety of different integrations within the Pearl 2 to specific education content management systems. And it can actually not only do the scheduling of the recordings for the lectures, but also get the lectures over into that content management system. The Pearl 2 supports not only H.264 encoding, but also H.265. So again, this is one of those situations looking forward to the future. H.265 is a far more efficient codec. You can get better quality by using and using less bandwidth. And as we start to see support for that on the major mass market platforms, I think you're gonna see that and find that'll be a really useful feature as well. Now, one thing that's interesting about Pearl 2 for another use case that the A10 minis don't support is if you wanted to stream to your own website, say for example, you have a, a membership website of some sort where you have people that have signed up for your service, whatever that is, and you wanna be able to stream directly to them behind an authentication wall of some sort or a paywall. You can do that using HLS with the Pearl 2. So you can stream directly to your own site and you don't have to use one of the mass market platforms if you don't want to. Another thing that is interesting is that if you are, for example, we're producing a show that was at a hotel, like a conference type of thing and streaming it, 
There is also live transcription capabilities that are not built in, but you can add from Epifan Video. So that's all integrated. So if you did need to add that capability, maybe just rent it for a particular show, or if you do a lot of shows that require that, that's an option as well. And of course, if six inputs is not enough for you, you can always use a traditional switcher in front of the Perl and then feed the program output of that into the Perl. And in fact, a lot of the, like even the A10 Mini Extremes have two outputs. And so you could feed two different things via that if you wanted to into the Perl. Now, this is not a cheap device, as I mentioned before, $7,500 USD. And you might be scratching your head for those of you that are more hobby streamers or side hustle streamers and thinking when in the world would this ever make sense for anybody to buy this other than the largest production companies. And the reality is it really is aimed more at the corporate setups, the education world for maybe house of worship, um, anything where you're doing these productions where there is a budget involved, a substantial budget involved, and they're expecting high quality results. That's where something like this makes sense. Now, you might say, well, I could probably piece together a Blackmagic or other broadcast switching system and encoder for a lot less money. So let's let's think about that. So I have a Blackmagic ATEM 2 ME switcher. That's about a $4,000 switcher, as I recall. Plus I have a $1,500 encoder that I put with that. So now we're at 5,500. Plus I have five decimator 4K capable cross converters those are $500 each, so I've got five of those. So I'm already up to the same price as an Pearl 2. So you can see how they actually are, not, it's not as ridiculous a price as it seems, because once you had to add all those other things to your setup with a more traditional broadcast switcher, you're in the same ballpark. And from my point of view, some of the features that the Pearl 2 has that those other things don't have built in make it a pretty compelling option. So. Hopefully, again, I'm not trying to sell the Pearl 2. I realize that the market for them is, is relatively limited, but the I, I hope that gives you some context for where a tool like this makes sense. And if you ever find yourself in a situation where you have been hired to do a production where you really do need to deliver all of these things, Pearl 2 may actually make sense for that situation. So hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And I'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.